الرحمن الرحيم والصلاة والسلام على نبينا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين. My dear brothers and sisters in Islam, this speech is about our Sheikh Sheikh Muhammad Al Amin Al Shankiti. A great scholar, a great teacher, and uh, that is the benefit of a journey to seek the knowledge. In Arabic, it is called a rehla fi talab al ilm, because if you stay in your own country, you might not come across many many teachers of high caliber. But uh, once you travel and go to different countries, you will meet different scholars. So in my case, I can say that uh, I got this journey as well from uh, Pakistan to Al Madina Al Munawwarah. And it was a real journey. How? Because in those days, in 1962, the first batch which uh, went from Pakistan to study in Medina because that University of Medina was set up in 1961 and in 1962 the first batch from Pakistan went there. So we have to come to Karachi and from Karachi the Saudi Embassy have provided us with tickets for a ship. Uh, so that was uh, a voyage to Jidda and from Jidda to Al Madina. So, in those times, there used to be a very large ship known as Safina al Hujjaj, a boat for pilgrims, which used to take the pilgrims from Karachi to Jidda, come back, and then it will take another uh, uh, party. Each time, they they can carry around five thousand. Passengers. It was such a great and massive ship, Safina al Hujjaj, of many stories. But uh, it was July 1962 when we went uh, by this ship to Jeddah, and because that ship has already brought the pilgrims. So when it was going back to pick more pilgrims, it was empty. There were no passengers except we, 18 students, and the crew, the crew of the ship. So it was a rehla, a journey for the seek of knowledge. It took seven days. We stopped at uh, at Aden. In English, it is called Eden, but it is Aden of Yemen. We stopped there, and we went to Aden as well. It was a British protectorate at that time, and for a few hours. And then the boat uh, uh, continued with its journey to Jeddah. So it took seven days, and after Umrah, we went to Medina, and this is how we joined that university. So in that university, Alhamdulillah, at that time, at, this was the glorious period of Islamic university because great, great teachers were there, like Sheikh Muhammad Al Amin Al Sunqiti. About whom I am going to speak a lot, and then Sheikh Muhammad Nasiruddin Al Albani, a great muhaddis from Albania originally, but he was brought up in Syria. <coughs> and uh, then the head of the university was uh, the greatest scholar, Sheikh Abdul Aziz bin Baz. He was uh, the head of Islamic University, and uh, he used to teach as well. And there were many other scholars. Among those, uh, among uh, those scholars, uh, the one who is still alive is Sheikh Abdul Muhsin Hamad Al Abbad. He was our teacher of Aqidah, and uh, he lives now in Medina. But his son Abdul Razak, he is a teacher in the university. Two years after uh, my admittance to this uh, university, in 1964. My father joined the university as a teacher because uh, a deputation went to Pakistan to bring some more teachers. 
So our uh, Sheikh Abdul Qadir bin Shabatul Hamd, our teacher of uh, Hadith, he went to, he was an Egyptian. He went to Karachi and uh, he came to my father and then he made a contract with him to study, to teach in Medina. And then he went to Punjab area in Gujranwala. There was a great scholar, Hafiz Muhammad Gundalvi. So he made a contract with him as well. So these two teachers came from Pakistan. Hafiz Gundalvi, he remained only for, uh, for one year and then he went back because of his personal circumstances. But my father remained there for 16 years until retirement. So he retired in 1980 and then went back to Pakistan. So I, but I was saying that this is the benefit of the journey, journey to seek knowledge. So we got such a great teacher, Sheikh Muhammad Al-Amin Shankiti. Even those people who may be uh, uh, against him in Aqeedah, means they don't agree with him in Aqeedah, but after listening to him, they would admire him. And uh, I remember that during Hajj time, because people come from various parts of the world for Hajj, they come to Mecca, they come to Medina, and some of them, they come to our university as well to just see that university. So among those visitors was the head of Tehran University. Tehran is in Iran. So you can understand that uh, he was from uh, Shia, but any, anyhow he was, the, he was the president of the university and he asked permission to sit in the lesson of Sheikh Muhammad al-Amin al-Shanqiti. So normally they will bring a chair for a visitor to sit and listen. And for the students, of course, we got our desks. Each desk, two students. So my colleague who always sat with me was one from Pakistan, from the same batch, Muhammad Ibrahim al-Khalil, rahimahullah. So this man listened to the lecture of our sheikh in tafsir, because he was our sheikh in tafsir and also in usul al-fiqh, the principles of fiqh. And after uh, listening to sheikh, he asked the sheikh, can I say a few words? And he said, all right, say it. So he stood up and he said in Arabic, because he knew Arabic, he said that I have attended many, many lessons. I have seen many, many shiukh. But I have never seen a sheikh like yours, this sheikh Muhammad al-Amin al-Shanqiti. He is just like Bukhari in Hadith. He is just like Ibn Jarir in Tafsir. He is just like Sibaweh in Grammar, in Nahab, and so on and so forth. He started praising him. And then he took permission and went away. And our sheikh, he was listening, and he got just one remark, very, very simple remark. Who was that person? Shu Hada, Man Hada, Man Hada. He just said Man Hada. Ish Hada. He said Ish Hada. And I also remember another incident. Our Sheikh uh, once said in his lesson that people come to me with uh, their degrees. Degree in Arabic language is called Shahada. So somebody would come to me and he would say, I got the Shahada of M.A. Majesty in Arabic Majesty. I got the Shahada of M.A. And another would come to me and he would say, I got the Shahada of Doctorate, the Torah. Huh? And then they asked me this question, Sheikh, what is your Shahada? Hmm? What is your Shahada? And Sheikh Muhammad al-Amin al said, I always say to them, my Shahada is Shahada to Allah, ilaha illallah, wa anna Muhammad rasulullah. That is my shahada. The word shahada is there. The word shahada is there. And uh, uh, my colleague, whose name was Muhammad Luqman as Salafi from India, rahimahullah ta'ala, as well, he wrote in his book, in his biography, that uh, 
in his class, in his class, when Sheikh Muhammad al-Amin al-Sunqiti was giving his lesson, <coughs> King Faisal came and uh, he sat there and he listened to the lecture of Sheikh Muhammad al-Amin al-Sunqiti. And of course, uh, uh, King Faisal was a, a great king and uh, a very wise person, very educated person. So he has enjoyed his lesson. But anyhow, he did not give any remarks and then he left away. As we know that uh, Sheikh Muhammad al-Amin, he is known as Shanqiti. Shanqiti means from Shanqit. Shanqit is Mauritania. Mauritania now, Mauritania. But uh, actual Arabic name is Shanqit. Shanqit is a small town in that area. If uh, you got uh, a map of Africa, then go to West Africa. So, all right, let us start from Egypt. From Egypt, which country is after Egypt? Libya. After Libya, Tunisia. After Tunisia, Algeria. Algeria. After Algeria, Morocco. After Morocco, then you have to turn, uh, and it comes Mauritania. So that is Mauritania, a country of desert because it is not uh, uh, a green country like uh, Tunisia and Algeria because uh, the, the greater part of Mauritania is desert. So he belongs to that country which is Shanqib and he was born there in 1905. 1905. Now we can say that it was uh, a place called, as he mentioned, uh, a place called Kifa, which you can say a district. And in that uh, district, uh, you have this Itar that is in the north of Mauritania, or uh, Shanqit, where he was born. Now this country, because I visited that country in one of my journeys, when I was in East Africa, we went uh, in a conference, I think it was 1975 or 76, the conference of Rabitatul Alam al-Islami. We went there from uh, Nairobi, we have to go to Senegal. The capital of Senegal is Dakar. From Dakar, we have to go to Shanqit. So that was uh, the time when I have seen Shankit. It was a very small town, very small town, uh, which is the capital of uh, Mauritania, is Nawakshot. So we went to Nawakshot actually. <coughs> so at that time, Nawakshot was a very small town. I think uh, the biggest building, it was the hotel where we had to stay and uh, the conference was held. It was just uh, on the bank of uh, uh, Atlantic Ocean and all desert around it, just desert. And then, then there is a small road going towards the town. So we used to go to the town as well sometime. And it was just one single road going to the town. And you can see the houses on both sides of uh, that road and maybe small alleys and some other localities. So at that time it was a very, very simple town. But one thing which we have noticed, and for this the whole country is famous, of a great number of Hufas, those people who memorize the Quran. You will find many, many people, everyone is half of Quran, half of Quran. Quran. To the extent that you will find women, they are half of the Quran as well. She might be selling some uh, vegetables, some foods, but she is a Hafiz of her Quran, reading her Quran. Well. And the second thing for which the people of Shanket are famous, that is the poetry. Poetry in Arabic. So they are also the master of the poetry. We, in this visit, we visited uh, the Prime Minister who was used to be Mukhtar Vildada. In Arabic, wild, that is actually walad. 
Mukhtar walad dada. But in their language, they always say wild. Mukhtar will dada. Dada is the father. Mukhtar is the son. He was the prime minister, and he got a very simple house as well. And uh, he has invited some some of the members of uh, of that conference. So I was one of them. And uh, then after the dinner, there was a sitting of poetry only. So everyone who got good poetry could participate in it. So I just listened to them, but uh, many of them they they brought very good pieces of poetry. So that is uh, that is the country uh, to which Sheikh Muhammad Al Amin Al Shampiti belongs. Before I go to uh, more details about his life, but I want to say that when he died, when he died uh, around uh, the age of seventy, it was seventeen uh, Zulhijja of the last century, which is thirteen ninety three of Hijra. Seventeen Zulhijja means that just after Hajj. Just after Hajj, and he was buried in Al Mualla, which is the cemetery of Makkah Al Mukarram. The Sheikh uh, who wrote his biography is one of our Sheikh as well from Medina. His name is Atiya Muhammad Salim. Atiya Muhammad Salim. He is the one who has uh, published his Tafsir of Al Bayan. So he has said uh, in his biography, he says that when he died, of course he was buried in Makkah. So his uh, funeral prayer was held in Makkah. But in Medina, there was again a prayer which is known as Salatul Ghaib. So Salatul Ghaib, yani a prayer of funeral prayer upon a person who is not present. That is called Salatul Ghaib. It was held in, in the mosque of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Imam was uh, Sheikh Abdul Aziz bin Saleh Al Sheikh. Accidentally, he said that he read in first ayah of uh, Salatul Isha, "Inna al-ladina amanu wa amilu salihat kanat lahum jannatul firdaus nuzula." That is the last part of Surah Al-Kahf. Those people who believed and did good deeds. كانت لهم جنات الفردوس نزلا فردم آر the gardens of paradise as a place of entertainment in first raka and in the second raka he read the ayat last ayat surah maryam إن الذين آمنوا وعملوا الصالحات سيجعل لهم الرحمن ودا those people who believed and did good deeds Allah Rahman is going to Going to make for them love, love in the hearts of the people. So Sheikh Atiya asked the Sheikh, "Did you, did you read these ayat intentionally? Because you have to read Salatul Janaza upon Sheikh Muhammad Al Amin Al Shamkidi." He said, "No, it came accidentally in my mind when I read these ayat." So that was Sheikh Muhammad Al Amin bin Muhammad Al Mukhtar bin Abdul Qadir bin Muhammad bin Ahmad Nuh, and among their grand grandfathers, there is one called Yaqub bin Jaqin. Jaqin. So because of Jaqin, which is uh, his grand grandfather, he is also known as Al Jukani. It is an attribution to Jaqin, Al Jukani. So you will find his name, Sheikh Muhammad bin Al Amin Al Shamkiti Al Jokani, because of that name. So, how was his uh, uh, how how was his learning? And he, of course, uh, he learned at home, but uh, his father died when he was still a very young child. He just finished his juz amma. At that time, when his father died, so he was brought up by his uh, uh, by his uh, maternal uncle, maternal uncle. 
This is something good in Urdu language that we got different uh, terms for maternal uncle and paternal uncle. Huh? Paternal uncle is Chacha and maternal uncle is Mamu. But uh, in Arabic and in English it is just uncle. No, no, in Arab, no, sorry, in Arabic, uh, different name. In Arabic for uh, maternal uncle is Khal. Is Khal and for paternal uncle is Am. But in English that is just uncle. So he was brought up in the house of his uh, maternal uncle uh, where he finished uh, Al-Quran and uh, he memorized the Quran upon his uh, maternal uncle Abdullah bin Muhammad al Mukhtar. And he also learned Rasm of Al Mushaf al Usmani. Rasm. Rasm, what is Rasm? Because this word Rasm, normally Rasm means to draw something that is called Rasm. But when it is used for Quran, then it means something else. It means that uh, they don't uh, learn hips only, but they also learn that uh, the Quranic words, how they are written. Where is Madda? Where is no Madda written, but still you have to pronounce it as Madda? That is Madda. And you will see the sign of Madda. Sometimes there is no sign of Madda, but still you have to prolong your voice with the letter. And we know that uh, there are three letters which are, which are uh, prolonged in your voice, Alif and Vau and Ya. And in Rasm, they also learn something else. Which word is mentioned in Quran only once? Which word is mentioned twice and how it is mentioned? Which word is mentioned thrice and with what variation and so on and so forth. So when a person is memorizing a Quran and he knows that this is the same words for, uh, for the word, for example, in Surah Al-Qamar, وَلَقَدْ أَهْلَكْنَا أَشْيَاعَكُمْ The word ashya, وَلَقَدْ أَهْلَكْنَا أَشْيَاعَكُمْ بِالْفَتْحَ no? And in Surah Saba, the word is كَمَا فُعِلَ بِأَشْيَاعِهِمْ So the word ashya is used only twice in the Quran. So marra, uh, once it is mansub, ashya'akum. And once it is majroor, bi ashya'ihim. In the same word, the word a'yunuhum, a'yunuhum, that has been used three times. The word a'yunuhum in the Quran. So that is going to help the person not to do any mistake in his hips if he knows that this word, in uh, this surah it is coming mansub with fatha, and in this surah it is coming marfu, bamma. And in this surah it is coming Majroor Kasra. And he also says that I have uh, read grammar, which is a nahab, upon uh, my aunt, the wife of his uh, maternal uncle. And as I said that the women, they were also very well versed in Arabic language. And they used to learn Ansab as well. Ansab means uh, uh, all the family lines of the tribe and then especially the family line of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And the other thing is that most of these knowledges they would learn it in poetry because in poetry it is easier for you to memorize it. So once you memorize any of these knowledges then you grasp them, you grasp uh, the whole grammar, the whole seerah, the whole usul al-fiqh, the whole usul al-hadith, that becomes very easy for them. So Shaykh Ash-Shamqiti, mashallah, he learned all these knowledges in the poetry in the beginning. 
And then he, him, he himself uh, uh, wrote the poetry as well of uh, some of these knowledges. Uh, and then he le learned uh, the other sciences or other knowledges like al fiqh al maliki and uh, all other knowledges I'm going to mention about them. But the main thing is, he says, the way they were taught, tariqat al talim, the way they were taught. It is a Bedouin country. There are no schools, no colleges, no madaris. So what happens, a sheikh comes from anywhere and then he stays at one place, either in a tent or in a house. And then the students flock to him to learn the knowledge from him. So this place is called Murabit. So the sheikh, when he comes to a place, he becomes Murabit there as if he is just guarding that place. If he is himself a wealthy person, he would help the students with food, with uh, other of uh, their uh, needs. And if he himself is not a rich person, then people are going to help him. People of that locality are going to help him. And another thing which was very interesting, that one time only one knowledge is given. In Arabic it is called fun. Fun al nahw fun al sarf fun al hadith fun al tafsir fun means knowledge so at one time only one fun is taught once you finish it then you move to another fun so this will make you a very good knowledgeable person in that fun In the case of Sheikh Muhammad al-Amin al, al when they have seen that this person is very intelligent, they allowed him to learn two fun at one time. That was only for him, this facility. All others, they have to learn only one fun. Now we can notice uh, the way Sheikh uh, Muhammad al-Amin al has taken his knowledge that he did not travel in the beginning. All his knowledge came in the house of his maternal uncle. He himself says about himself that uh, I was a lad who loves playing, huh? who loves playing. And my family, they will say to me, sit and learn. So for, he says that uh, when they told me the alphabet, which is known in Arabic as a tahjiya alphabet, and how each letter is pronounced with fatha or kasra or vamma, alif zabar a, we, like, we say like this, alif fatha a, alif vamma u, alif kasra e, that is called the Arab. So he said that when they taught me just one or two letters, and they say, oh, next day we are going to teach you more letters. He said, no, I will learn myself because it is very easy. So he will pick all the letters and how they are pronounced. Once he finished the, uh, the memorization of Al-Quran and also the knowledge of Rasm, which I have just explained, His maternal uncle and uh, the family were so happy that uh, her aunt provided him now for a journey. Now you can go to another place to learn more. So they prepared for him, for his journey, two camels. One camel for him to travel upon and his books. So he and his books are on one camel. And the second camel got all what he needs, his food, his clothes, every other thing which he needed in his, uh, in his journeys. And one servant who got so many cows with him as well. So you can imagine that uh, this person belonged to a rich family, a good family. So with all these... Uh, uh, two camels and uh, so many cows and the servant. He now started traveling 
until he found a sheikh and he said uh, the sheikh said to him what do you want and he answered him in arabic poetry and when he answered him in arabic poetry he was so impressed he said yes come uh, and learn from me here it is also mentioned that uh, when he was young maybe 15 15 years old or 16 years old somebody suggested to him to marry you, you should you should marry now so he said seeking knowledge is more important to me so he used to attend his sheikh if any issue becomes very difficult for him to understand he was not satisfied with the answer of his sheikh so a certain issue became very delicate complicated for him so he said that let me find the answer myself because sheikh can't satisfy me so he got a servant with him as well from zohar prayer he started reading the book a uh, 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 yani about this issue then asr came he prayed asr then he started uh, reading until maghrib was due he prayed maghrib and then his servant he kindled the fire because it was a bedouin life he kindled the fire for night gave him some tea and he started taking the tea which is green tea and reading the book as well he prayed isha after isha he started reading as well he kept on reading until fajr time uh, fajr time he uh, he has solved the question he has solved that difficulty which he is uh, which has come across so after the prayer fajr prayer he went to sleep and here i remember that famous uh, line of poetry by mutanabbi al mutanabbi was a great poet as you know he said yaghusul bahra man talab al ali wa man talab al ula sahir al layali yaghusul bahra man talab al ali the person who wants pearls he dives long deep into the sea and the person who is seeking after a great place in the world sahir al layali he remains awake at night time he remains awake at night time for what <laughs> for learning not for uh, watching the tv <laughs> no for learning for books and he got an appetite for uh, poetry as well so he has written some poetry and then he abandoned it he abandoned it and then once he was asked why did you abandon saying the poetry he said that poetry is not a character of good great people hmm? because in poetry they say the best poetry is akzabuhu aghabuhu akzabuhu aghabuhu more you lie in the poetry more sweeter it becomes <laughs> and then he said imam shafi he was a poet as well imam shafi was a poet but imam shafi has said walaw la shi'ru bil ulama yuzri la kuntu ash'ara min labidi walaw la shi'ru bil ulama yuzri why did i uh i leave the poetry because the poetry is going to bring a defect a defect to an alim to a knowledgeable person because of that reason i have abandoned it but if i wanted to continue with the poetry i would be a greater poet than the famous poet in jahiliya labid labid ibn rabi'a 
لبید ابن ربیہ بات سے ویری ویری گریٹ پوائنٹ آف جاہلیہ حسد علا کل شئین ما خل اللہ باطلو و کل نعیمن و کل نعیمن بعدہا لزائلو لبید became Muslim and he is known as Mukhadram. Mukhadram means that he got Jahiliya and he got Islam both. So he lives, uh, he lived 60 years in Jahiliya and 60 years in Islam. وَلَا كُلُّ شَيْءٍ مَا خَلَى اللَّهَ بَاطِلُ وَكُلُّ نَعِيمٍ لَا مَحَالَ تَزَائِلُ لَا مَحَالَ تَزَائِلُ That is his uh, line of poetry. He was also, Sheikh Muhammad Rami Shankiti, after getting all these knowledges, he became very famous in giving decisions in disputes. Al-Qaba. So people used to come to him to, to, to have uh, decisions in their matters. And his way of uh, deciding the issue was that when two persons come to him for any dispute, First thing he would ask them, sign here that you are going to accept my decision. That is the first. So if they both sign, then he would say, he would say to claimant, he would say to the claimant, Al Muddai, write your your plea, whatever you want to write, whatever you are claiming against this other person. And then he will show it to the defendant a respondent and respondent would write his answer and then Sheikh would compare both of them and then he would write his decision and then he would say to them this is my decision take it to anybody to any other Sheikh show him this decision so if they have to differ with it then I am going to see why they are differing with me. But nobody would differ with the decision of Sheikh Muhammad al-Amin al He, These people would show that decision to the rulers. Rulers means uh, the governor of that province, for example. And when they say, oh, this is from Sheikh Muhammad al-Amin al Yes, we are going to implement his, rule, his decision. Except for two things, he would not give his uh, decision. That is, if the matter is related to hudud or to the blood. If somebody has murdered someone, he said, no, it will go to the proper qadi, which was appointed by the government. At those days, that area was governed by the French. It was the French colony. So, it was the duty of the French governor to give his decisions in the matter of murder. But he has made a committee, a committee of two sheikh, two mashayikh. And this committee is going to look into the decision of the ruler. So Sheikh Muhammad al-Amin al shumpiti was one member of that committee as well. So it means that uh, the governor said that we are not going to take the law of retaliation, al qisas We are not going to kill a person because he murdered someone until these two sheikh will approve that decision. So it shows that how great and esteemed position Sheikh Muhammad al-Amin al sunqiti got. Now comes uh, his journey towards Hajj and that has changed everything. He went for Hajj and uh, of course, uh, that was a long, long route from Mauritania. He passed by Sudan as well. Wherever he went, people knew about his knowledge and uh, they are going to benefit from him. Same happens when he was in Mecca. He went for Hajj. He was in Medina. He got his own tent. Next to his tent was the tent of Al-Amir Khalid al-Sudairi. Amir Khalid al-Sudairi, the Prince Khalid al-Sudairi. Because Sudairi is uh, that, uh, 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 that tribe from where comes the mother 
or the wife of King Abdul Aziz, the founder of modern Saudi Arabia. So, those sons who were born from this Sudari mother, they are seven who ruled right from the beginning. King Saud and then King Faisal and then King Khalid. So they are all Sudari, they are known as Sudari. So that was the tent of Khalid the Sudari. And in this tent, because in Mina, daytime, you got nothing to do. So there was uh, a sitting in which they were discussing some poetry. And they might have uh, some difficulty to understand one specific line of poetry in which they got uh, some difference of opinion. Somebody said, there is a great sheikh from Mauritania in next tent, bring him. So they invited him. And Sheikh Muhammad al-Amin al when he spoke about the poetry, about the explanation of that poet, of that poem, Khalid al-Sudari was so impressed. He said, when you go to Medina, meet the Sheikh there, the Sheikh of Al-Masjid al-Nabawi, Sheikh Abdul Aziz bin Saleh, and then another Sheikh, Sheikh Abdullah al-Zahim. It means, of course, that he recommended him to these two shiuch, maybe by a letter. So when he came to al Madina and he met uh, these two Sheikh, they were also very impressed by his knowledge. But till that time, Sheikh Muhammad al-Amin al-Shanqiti was well versed in Maliki fiqh, the fiqh of Imam Malik, which is uh, prevalent in all Western Africa. So Sheikh Abdul Aziz bin Saleh gave him al uh, the famous Hanbali fiqh book, Al-Mughni. Mughni is only in fiqh, but he gave him the books of Sheikh al-Islam. When we say Sheikh al-Islam means Sheikh al-Islam ibn Taymiyyah. Sheikh al-Islam ibn Taymiyyah. So Sheikh Muhammad al-Amin al shanqiti before that he, he did not read uh, Sheikh al-Islam ibn Taymiyyah at all. But here got, uh, he got the opportunity to read the book of Sheikh al-Islam and this is how he knew about the difference between al ashaira in Al-Aqidah and the Mazhab of Salaf of Imam Ahmad, especially about the attributes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That is the main issue, which is the issue of Sifat. And Sheikh Muhammad al-Amin al shanqiti completely changed his uh, opinion and he adopted the opinion of Salaf. King Abdul Aziz allowed him to start his lesson in Masjid al-Nabawi, in the mosque of al-Madina. Al 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 so this is how he started his lesson in the mosque of al-Madina. And because he was not uh, very familiar with the books of Hadith, and when people started asking him questions about different fiqh issues, at that time, Sheikh Muhammad al-Amish Shantiti started reading by himself like Fatul Bari, which is the explanation of Sahih al-Bukhari, and uh, Nal al-Awtar, which is uh, a book by ash shawkani in all fiqhi issues, but based upon the hadith of the Prophet So we can say that his knowledge of hadith uh, expanded a lot. Before that, he was a very famous scholar in, in tafsir, tafsir of the Quran, in grammar, in all other, in usul. But now, mashallah, he acquired uh, the knowledge of hadith. Well. I have heard uh, uh, his uh, lecture in Al Madina, not in the university itself. There was uh, another institution in Al Madina which is known as Darul Hadith. Darul Hadith is a very, very old institution and uh, it was started by uh, some, some famous wealthy persons who came from Delhi, from Delhi, from India and they uh, used to sponsor Darul Hadith. So Darul Hadith was a seat of knowledge as well and it still exists. 
So in Darul Hadith, I have heard his lecture about Al Asma wa Sifat, the attributes, the names and attributes of Allah Subhanahu wa Taala. Even Sheikh Nibad was there to listen to to this lecture, and uh, it has been published. This lecture is now published and it is available. Mm -hmm. The other great mashayikh of uh, Saudi Arabia, like Sheikh Abdul Latif bin Ibrahim, Al Sheikh, when he heard his lecture about the attributes and about salaf, uh, he was impressed a lot that this person is uh, uh, is totally expanding the aqidah of salaf in these matters. He started his lesson in Al Masjid al Nabi in 1363 of Hijrah. After the death of a Sheikh of Tayyib, who was uh, delivering the lessons before him. So, after his death in 1363, he started his lessons, which was uh, in, uh, in the tafsir. And uh, of course, the way of Sheikh was a unique way. He would uh, mention the grammar as well, he would mention the background of each and every ayah. After seven years in 1371, because in Riyadh, Al Mahad al Ilmi, yani, like Darul Ulum, an institution for knowledge was started. So he moved to Riyadh. And after Al Mahad al Ilmi, then a college of Sharia was started as well. Once First the College of Sharia, the second the College of Language, Huliyat al So he moved to al Riyaz, where he stayed for seven years. In 1381 of Hijra, Islamic University of Medina was established, 1381, which is 1961. So 1381, Islamic University started and he was invited to be a lecturer in this university. So once again he moved back to Al Madina. And this is how we benefited from him because he was there in Al Madina. And uh, he got his lessons in the morning in the university, in the evening he got a lesson after Maghrib in, uh, in the mosque as well. And as I said before that he was very famous uh, for uh, tafsir <coughs> and also for usul al-fiqh, for usul al-fiqh. So uh, he, and we have learned from him usul al-fiqh as well, and some, uh, mostly in tafsir, but also some lessons in usul. At one point he was given the nationality of Saudi Arabia by the king, so this is how he settled down in Saudi Arabia. He came from Mauritania for Hajj, but Allah SWT wanted him to stay in Al-Hijaz, in Makkah al -Madina. The king of Morocco, Muhammad al khamis Muhammad the fifth, came to Riyadh. And when he was coming to al Madina, he said, I want the company of the Sheikh. So, Sheikh Muhammad al-Amin al shamqiti came with him to al Madina, and in al Madina, in front of him and some other dignitaries, he gave the lecture about this ayah, Al-Yawma Akmaltu Lakum Deenakum Wa Atmantu Alaykum Ni'mati Wa Radiyatu Lakum Al Islam Adina So this became a very, very famous lecture, which has been printed later. Anyhow, I myself, I was, I graduated in 1966, so I left, in 1967, I left uh, Al-Madina, going to my first appointment that was in East Africa, Nairobi. Sheikh himself, in, uh, and after, uh, I, I graduated, you can say, according to Hijra date, which was, 66, Hijra would be 86, 86 of Hijra. So in 86 of Hijra, another institution was opened in Riyadh, 
which is known as Ma'had al-Qadha al-Ali, Ma'had al-Qadha al-Ali, the institution of, the high institution for judiciary. So Sheikh Muhammad al was uh, given a task to stay two weeks in Medina and then another two weeks in Riyaz to give lectures there as well. So now he uh, started moving between Medina and Riyadh. There is another institution in uh, Saudi Arabia called Hayatu Kibar al Ulama. After the death of the first Mufti, Muhammad ibn Ibrahim, he was the Grand Mufti. There was no committee beside him. But after his death, the government has established a committee for great scholars. So it is known as Hayatu Kibar al Ulama. And Sheikh Muhammad al Amin al was one of uh, the members of that committee to give fatwa. Rabatatul Alam al Islami, that was also established the same year, I think, when uh, Medina University was established in 1961. And Sheikh Muhammad al Amin al was the founder member of Rabita as well. What happened? that uh, when this uh, Rabita was established, there was a delegation from Iran. And they wanted to be a member in uh, Rabita as well. And they also wanted something uh, specific, that you have to recognize Al-Mazhab Al-Jafari. Al-Mazhab Al-Jafari is the Mazhab of uh, Shia. They say that Officially, you should recognize it, so we, we, we would become a member of Rabitatul Alam al Islami as well. Now, how to, how to treat them? That was a very difficult job. They gave their job to Sheikh Muhammad al Amin al Sankiti, deal with them. So, Sheikh Muhammad al Amin al Sankiti sat uh, with the delegation of Iran and he explained to them that. There are many things which are common between us and you. You believe in uh, prayer, you in zakat, in fasting, in hajj. These are all common things. And because of common things, we can be united. We can uh, sit uh, together. But, again, there are few things which are a bone of contention among, among us. There are differences as, as well. So I suggest, I suggest that you send a delegation of ulama, some scholars, your scholars to us, and we scholars will sit with them and we will discuss all these issues in which we are differing. Hmm? And once the haq emerges, haq come, comes out, then you have to accept it. Hmm? And there will be no problem. <laughs> if uh, you join the Rabita. And you know that, are they going to accept this condition? No, they never accepted this condition. And this is how, this is how they, uh, they have uh, solved this problem. Sheikh Muhammad al-Amin al-Sanqiti got uh, so many books, but very famous books and very books of great knowledge. There are not many. You can say just nine books. The top of these nine books is his tafsir book, Awwa'ul Bayan, Awwa'ul Bayan fi Sharh al-Qur'an bil-Qur'an. And uh, this book, as I said in the beginning, was published, edited by Sheikh Atiyah Muhammad Salim, one of the teachers in al Madina University and one of his students. So Awal Bayan, which was uh, dictated by a Sheikh, and uh, this dictation ended with Surah Al-Mujadira. Surah Al-Mujadira is the first surah of 28th part of our Quran. And that was the end of, uh, of Tafsir, which Sheikh Muhammad Al-Amin al dictated by himself. And then he died. So Sheikh Muhammad, uh, Sheikh Atiyah Muhammad Salim, what he did, he compiled the remaining tafsir from Surah Al-Hashr. 
till the end, Surah Al-Nas, which is around two parts of the Quran. By taking the knowledge from different tapes, because Sheikh must have given so many lectures about uh, this surah as well. So he listened to these tapes and then he also adopted the methodology which Sheikh adopted in all his book of Tafsir. So whatever he writes will be in line with the usul of uh, Al Imam Sheikh Muhammad Ramin al Shamkiti. That is the Adwal Bayan. And then uh, uh, there are some s small treatises or small books. There are three. One is Man'u Jawaz al Majaz fil Munazzal lit Ta'abud wal Ijaz. Because Sheikh believes that there is no Majaz in Al Quran. Majaz means Majaz is opposite of Al Haqiqa. Al Haqiqa is the real meaning. Al-Majaz is the figurative meaning. So Sheikh Muhammad Al-Amin al shantiti would say that there is no Majaz in Al-Quran. I just give you one example. For example, in Surah, Surah Yusuf, <coughs> when the brethren of Yusuf are saying, uh, the elder brother has, has sent a message to his father, وَسْأَلِ الْقَرْيَةَ الَّتِي كُنَّا فِيهَا وَالْعِيرَ الَّتِي أَقْبَلْنَا فِيهَا وَسْأَلِ الْقَرْيَةَ الَّتِي كُنَّا فِيهَا Asked the village where we were. A village is a modern term of Qariya, but the olden term is the town. Because Makkah is Ummul Khura, is the mother of the towns. You, you can't say mother of the villages, <laughs> mother of the towns. So Qariya, وَسْأَلِ الْقَرْيَةَ الَّتِي كُنَّا فِيهَا Ask that Qariya, the town where we were. Yani, did we do anything? Stealing or not. So those people who believe in majaz, in figurative language, they would say, this is majaz. You can't ask the town. Huh? It means we have to ask the people in the town. So al-qariya means ahl al-qariya. Was al ahl al-qariya. The people of the town. But Sheikh uh, Muhammad al-Amin al would say, no. These are all the different ways known in Arabic language that a person would uh, address something which is not human. They would address it. And when they address it, it does not mean uh, that uh, uh, you have to find majaz here. No, that was a way of their expression. For example, uh, Imra al Qais, the famous uh, Poet is addressing the night. Allah ayu halalu tawilu alanjali bi subhin mamal isbahu min kabi amsali. He is addressing the night. Oh night, come to an end, come to an end. Huh? But then he says, even if you come to an end, the morning would not be different than you. Hmm? So he says that this is uh, a way of Arabic language, addressing the night. In the same way, when you say was al qariya, ask the town. We understand that it means that we have to ask the people. So it is not uh, a figurative language. So this book and the other book is Dafo i Hamil Istirab and Ayl Kitab. There are sometimes some, time, some uh, ayat in the Quran which seems to be contradictory among themselves. But Sheikh would explain that there is no contradiction. For example, in Surah Al-Rahman, فَيَوْمَيْذٍ لَا يُسَلُوا عَنْ بَمْبِهِ إِنْ سُنْ وَلَا جَانْ That day, nobody is going to be questioned, whether a human being or a jinn. Nobody is going to be questioned. And the other surah says, وَقِفُوهُمْ إِنَّهُمْ لَمَسْقُولُونَ Stop them, they are going to be questioned. So it seems uh, contradictory. So Sheikh is going to explain that there is no contradiction here, no contradiction here. These are two different stages. There is one stage when people would come out from their graves, there would be no questioning at that time. And there would be another stage when everybody is going to be stopped and questioned. So in this way, he is going to explain all the contradictory ayat in the Quran. And his uh, third famous book is Muzakkiratul Usul ala Rawzatil Nadi. 
Rodat uh, al-Nazir, that is the book of Usul al-Fiqh in Fiqh al-Hanbali, and he did an explanation of that book. Anyhow, he got these nine books, many famous lectures. I have mentioned two of them. And uh, because I can uh, see the time as well, so how much time we can take now? We have, we have no time. Huh? Just now, we have no time. All right. So, we can uh, take a few more points. That Sheikh, uh, if, yani, in the course of his discussion, if he thinks that uh, what he said before was wrong, and now the true thing has appeared in front of him, he would accept that truth. He is not like uh, those scholars who become arrogant. Even if they are wrong, they are not going to accept their wrong. They would say, whatever we have said, that is final. But Sheikh was not of that nature. And he said that uh, uh, though you know, people normally when they go for Hajj, they do Hajj Tamattu. Hajj Tamattu means you do your Umrah, come out of the state of Iran, then you do your Hajj. That is called Tamattu. And there is Hajj Qiran, you do your Umrah and Hajj together. Don't pull out of your ihram in between. And there is ifrad means just to have the intention of hajj only, with no umrah. Now there is a great discussion between uh, the scholars that which one is more meritorious, which one is, uh, is going to attract you more reward. So normally they say that is tamattu hajj, tamattu. And some people would say that uh, you can't do ifrad. Ifrad is only for the people of Makkah. People who live in Makkah, they need not go to. They need not to go for for Umrah. They, they live there. So on the day of Hajj, they will go straight away to Mina and from Mina to Arafat. So ifrad is only for the people of Makkah. But in Madhab Maliki, they say the Afdal Hajj, the most meritorious Hajj is ifrad. They say ifrad. So what uh, Sheikh Shankiti did, he believed that ifrad is jayz. He does not say that he is the more meritorious, but it is jayz. Just to show that it is jayz, once he did ifrad. And he went from Medina, he did his ifrad hajj, just to show the people that they must not think that ifrad is not jayz. No, it is jayz. In the very, uh, another example is that he has written in one of his uh, lectures, or he has said in one of his lectures, that the four sacred months, their sanctity, that has been abrogated. Al-Ashhar al-Haram Mansukha, that is abrogated. But later, when he uh, came to Al-Madina, he said, no, I was wrong. Al-Ashhar al-Haram, they are not abrogated. They are, the, the, the ruling still is applicable. In the very same way, he has written in his uh, book about uh, the jewelry, the jewelry of uh, jewelry which is used by the woman. The jewelry which is used by the woman. There are two opinions. One opinion is that even there is zakat in jewelry which you are wearing, and uh, the evidence is that the prophet, the hadith of Jabir that uh, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam has seen a woman with a young girl which got two golden bangles in her hands or arms. And the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, do, uh, do you pay zakat for these uh, two bangles? She said, no. Then the Prophet said, then these two bangles are the bangles of fire. Throw them. Hmm? So from there, the ruling comes that if you have given, if you have given zakat, then it was jaz for you, for jaz for the woman to wear. And the second opinion is that there is no zakat in such jewelry which is worn by the woman. 
That is the, the opinion of Shafi'iyah. And the opinion of Hanafiya is that even the jewelry which is worn by the woman, there is zakat applicable. And according to this uh, hadith, this opinion of Hanafiya, that is stronger. That is stronger. So what Sheikh uh, Shankiti has written in his book, he said that this hadith which says that uh, he, the Prophet said to that girl, did you pay the zakat of that? That was in, that was at that time when wearing gold was haram upon women. Wearing gold was haram upon women. Later they were allowed to wear the gold. So this is why the Prophet wasallam said that you have to throw them into the fire if you don't pay the cards. So he said these words that this was the time when wearing golden jewelry for women was haram. I have checked it this morning. Tafsir Abwaul Bayan as well. Yes, it is written there. Somebody said to him later, Sheikh, just tell us one thing. If it was haram upon the woman to wear the jewelry, the Prophet ﷺ cannot approve something haram at all. He should have said to the woman, this is haram upon you, throw it. But he did not say that. He said, do you pay zakat? If you pay zakat, then it is alright. If you don't pay zakat, then it becomes something uh, wrong for you and throw it. Prophet is not going to say about a haram thing that it is haram but give zakat for it. It can't be. And Sheikh Sankriti said, yes, 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 yes. This is the point I did not <laughs> realize. And he said that when my book is going to be printed once again, I am going to correct it. So that is a, a, a great, uh, great character of such a person to admit, to admit his mistake. And uh, it is just like the saying of Sayyidina Umar. He wrote a famous letter to Abu Musa al-Ashari, who was appointed as a governor. وَلَا يَمْنَعَنَّكَ قَضَاءٌ قَضَيْتَهُ بِالْأَمْسِ ثُمَّ رَاجَعْتَ فِيهِ نَفْسَكَ وَظَهَرَ لَكَ الْحَقِّ أَنْ تَأْخُذَ بِهِ فَالْحَقُّ أَحَقُّ أَنْ يُتَّبَعَا If you have forgiven a decision yesterday and then you thought about it and then it appeared to you that this decision was wrong then you have to, you have to uh, refute that decision and accept what is the truth. فَالْأَحَقُّ فَالْحَقُّ أَحَقُّ أَنْ يُتَّبَعَا Because haq is more deserving to be followed. Here, uh, let me, let me uh, mention an interesting conversation between him and my father. My, because my father, Sheikh Abdul Farasan, he was a teacher there as well. And it was reported by someone. And then we have uh, reported this conversation in our book about my father. <coughs> now here is another opinion of Al-Imam Ash-Shanqiti, Muhammad Al-Amin Ash-Shanqiti. He believes, he believes that those ayat in the Quran, khasat in Surah al lamad which says that those people who are in the grave, they can't listen. Those people who are in the grave, you can't let them hear something. In Surah al room as well. Those people who are deaf, you can't make them listen. That is about deaf, of course, deaf people can't listen. But وَإِنَّكَ لَا تُسْمِعُ الْمَوْتَى وَلَا تُسْمِعُ الصُّمَّ الدُّعَى Before death it says, إِنَّكَ لَا تُسْمِعُ الْمَوْتَى You can't make the dead people hear. And then, وَمَا أَنْتَ بِمُسْمِعٍ مَنْ فِي الْقُبُورِ Those people who are in the graves, you can't make them listen. 
and this is our uh, our opinion this is the majority or uh, the right opinion that uh, you can't uh, make them listen the thing which they listen that is because once a person is buried just after burial two <coughs> angels come and they ask certain questions man rabbo ka ma dinu ka maza taqulu fi hadha ar-rajul and yeah about the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam these three questions but there is in this hadith that the soul are, is returned to the body when these questions are asked and the greater evidence for that is that the very same hadith says that in al mayyita yasma'u qara'a ni'alihim that uh, the dead person he hears the 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 sound of the retreating steps of the people when people are after the burial they go back so the dead person <coughs> he hears the sound of their retreating steps why because that was the time when the questioning was done the soul was there the soul not uh, in its full capacity the soul is written only to such a capacity that they could uh, he could answer the questions but because the soul is there this is why he hears the step sound as well and hadith does not say that he also listens to the step sound when the people were coming to bury him it does not say that because he was dead there was no soul at that time but our sheikh sheikh mohammed al amin al-sanqiti he got his opinion here he says that the dead hears the dead hears and his dalil is that when you go to the cemetery you say assalamu alaykum ya ahl al-qubur qubur antum salafuna wa nahnu bil asar o people of uh, the graves assalamu alaykum salam is upon you so he says that you are addressing So it means that they listen to you. This what he has written in Surah An-Naml, Tafsir of Surah An-Naml, and he says that uh, when Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala says, "Inna kala tusmu al-mauta," you can't make the dead people hear. It means kufar people who are just like dead people who don't want to understand anything. So al-mauta here means the dead, the kufar people. This what he says. <coughs> so the narrator says that uh, my father said to him to Sheikh Muhammad Al Amin Al Shamkiti, "What is the du'a of the new crescent? When we see the new crescent, we say, 'Allahumma ahillahu alayna bil amni wal Islam, ah, huh? bil amni wal iman, wa salamati wal Islam, Rabbi wa Rabbu kallah." Rabbi wa Rabbu kallah. Don't we say these words, addressing to the moon that my Rabb and your Rabb is Allah. You are addressing the moon. Rabbi wa Rabbu ka. Huh? Do you mean that moon hears you? <laughs> no, but this is an expression. This is an our expression. Does not mean that moon is hearing you in the very same way when you when you enter a cemetery you say Assalamu alaikum ya ahl al qubur. It does not mean that it does not mean that you are addressing them and they listen to you. It is du'a. Salamu alaykum. It is du'a. May we peace upon you. This is just du'a. Anyhow, the narrator says that Sheikh Shankiti was just smiling, but he did not reply. <laughs> he did not reply. He was just smiling. Now let us uh, move to a few more points, very very briefly, and. Uh, and a few things about his own character that uh, how generous he was how zahid he was yani uh, he will be content with anything with anything anything small he does not uh, look towards the wealth in the hands of other people he was very very generous in a very good in character this is why when he came to saudi arabia 
he brought his slave with him at that time slavery was prevalent even in west africa and during the time of king abdul aziz slavery was abolished when slavery was abolished sheikh mohammed al amin al qiti has to liberate the slave as well so he said to him you are free now this person could have gone could have left him but he said no sheikh i am going to live with you do i am free now but i want to live with you i want to serve you and i we have seen this uh, this person who used to drive sheikh mohammed al amin al qiti he got all uh, these books and especially of wal bayan but uh, he did not try to earn money through these books this is a great character mm-hmm. and he said he said about this factor that when i came from mauritania i came with a great treasure very great treasure je to be kanz in azim ma hi al kanz al azim ma huwa al kanz al azim what was this great treasures al qana he said contentness contentness i am content with what allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given me he is great to seek knowledge and again one thing which is very very striking he is not going to backbite any person he was never hard to say anything bad about a person he used to say to his brother this is a very very strange word itakayasu 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 what mean itakayasu <laughs> in arabic is there any word like this itakayasu but there is from kayasa from al kayis al kayis al kayis so he would use he would uh, he would say to them itakayasu become kayis become kayis and what does it mean become kayis not to backbite any person preserve your tongue preserve your tongue this is what he means and uh, uh, in his last last years of his life he stopped giving fatwa instead he would say scholars they say this opinion some other scholars they gave this opinion but he would not give uh, any opinion at all and uh, mm, among his children there were uh, two uh, two of his sons they were great scholars of islam as well and they are the teacher in sharia college so these are the other things which i think uh, that is enough for for <laughs> for this session because i wanted to give some characteristics of his tafsir as well tafsir as well but uh, that i think will become a different issue completely we are not going to cover it today at all whatever i have said <laughs> it is enough today but today it is enough insha allah sallallahu ta'ala ala nabiyyina muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'in assalamu alaykum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh